Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning, I woke up extra early to watch a presentation by Peter Begg of Rocket Lab about the company's next generation rocket, the Neutron. The Neutron is a successor to their highly successful Electron rocket. It's a lot bigger and a lot more capable. And by the way, I should point out, when I say I woke up at 5 a.m., I didn't set an alarm clock for this. Like, I wasn't intending to wake up for this. Uh, my body just sort of woke up and compelled me to watch it as if it has some sort of need for rockets. Uh, but yeah, um, Neutron, very interesting presentation. A lot of new stuff out there and quite a few digs at other rocket companies. I know the SpaceX fanboys are already getting like really uh, riled up about this, but seriously, it's not just SpaceX. It's Blue Origin, Relativity, a bunch of other companies. So yeah, Peter described the Neutron as being what a rocket should look like in 2050. It's something that's been designed with reusability in it from day one. It's not 100% reusable, but uh, it's as much of it as reusable as possible. It's only the second stage which has to be disposed of. And it's a second stage that's designed to be as light and simple as possible. And we'll talk about this. So Neutron is a much larger rocket than Electron. Electron is about 13 tons at launch and puts a few hundred kilograms into low Earth orbit. It can have third stages. It takes stuff to the moon and Venus even. But uh, it's a very small vehicle. Neutron is going to be a 500 ton rocket at launch and it's going to be able to put about 8, possibly even 15 tons into low Earth orbit. The vehicle is going to use methane and oxygen as a propellant. It's shorter and wider than Falcon 9, which by the way, Falcon 9 is roughly equivalent in performance to this. So, But Falcon 9 is designed to be moved along US roads. So it's like 12 feet diameter is the maximum that's allowed uh, with easy permitting. Like it gets harder if you have to move wider things down the road. So by not adhering to this 12 foot diameter, they've got a much wider vehicle, which makes it shorter. And presumably that helps make it more stable and also helps with atmospheric deceleration during the landing and recovery. So the propulsion on this is going to be the Archimedes engine, which is a new engine being developed by Rocket Lab. It's obviously methane oxygen. It's going to generate about one mega Newton of thrust or 100 tons. And instead of using the electrically pumped cycle that they use for the Rutherford on the rocket on the uh, electron, they're going to use a gas generator design. Now, this is the it's pretty much the same cycle that is used on the Falcon 9. It's a simple like first generation, easy to design, you know, uh, turbo pump design and you know, the reason you do this is because electricity works very well when you've got very small engines. But as you scale up the engines, the turbines get more efficient faster. So there's a point at which when your engine gets to a certain size, it makes vastly more sense to use gas powered turbines. And so that's what they're going to use here. Um, they're not going with a complex staged combustion cycle like Blue Origin or SpaceX or uh, ULA. They're going for a much simpler design and they think that that will actually help them run the engine at a slightly more benign state and, and make things easier and more efficient and or easier for them to maintain in the long term. The structure itself has landing legs built in for recovery and these are permanently attached fixed structures. They're more like wing strakes along the length of the body and presumably this is to help with the aerodynamics during descent. It'll probably give them more cross range capability and it might give them more drag which will in turn will actually reduce the overall re-entry stresses on the vehicle. They have four of these that come down permanently. Seven engines in the middle there. Um, at the front they have four movable fins for steering and those are primarily going to be used for steering on descent. They'll be fixed on ascent and you'll rely on engine gimballing. Uh, and then at the front you have a four part fairing. Now when they originally talked about, a, about the Neutron they showed off the fairing and it was a half fairing that they showed at that time. The renderings that they're showing now show a four way fairing that remains permanently attached to the rocket. Instead of dropping the fairing off and having those land in the ocean for recovery or even trying to catch them from a helicopter or a boat or whatever. These are doors that basically open up and the second stage flies out. Now the four-way fairings open up, uh, that looks an awful lot like you only live twice. And I'm going to point out that I, I'm pretty sure that this could, this rocket is designed to operate from any volcano base that you happen to have. 
Uh, so those will close up, the vehicle will then flip around using cold gas RCS thrusters and fire its main engine to return to the launch site and land on engines. That will give it eight tons to orbit capability. Peter also pointed out that it has a 15 ton maximum mass to orbit and that's presumably fully expendable. If they had a drone ship, they might be able to get something in between. So yeah, that's about 500 tons in total. And they also point out, by the way, this doesn't need any fancy launch infrastructure, say, to catch the booster or anything. In fact, with those big legs, I wouldn't be surprised if they just have to move it over a pit and, you know, just fuel it up on the pad and have it fly. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what that actually works out to. But yeah, volcano base, though, that's pretty essential as far as I'm concerned. Now, the second stage is really interesting because they said that they want to make this the lightest second stage ever built. And presumably that's, you know, per, uh, that's based on payload or whatever. But, you know, basic principle in engineering is that if you need compressive stress, then your structure needs thickness, right? So it has some sort of rigidity against compression. But under tension, it can be really, really thin because it doesn't, it's being pulled. So... The design has the second stage actually being supported by tension. So it's actually supported at the top with the payload above and the tanks and the engine below. It has a upper stage engine, which presumably is a derivative of the Archimedes. It might not be. Uh, actually, a 100 ton thrust is probably really high for a second stage. So they might have something that is smaller, more efficient. Not really clear on that. They didn't actually go into it. And above that sits the, the payload. So the whole second stage is inside this structure on the first stage. That means they don't need to make it aerodynamic. It doesn't have to handle loads from aerodynamics. Um, you know, it's a very simple structure and that's the only part that they're throwing away. So you see how encapsulating it does add mass to the first stage, but it's mass that's being recovered. I also think it's worth pointing out that since Neutron uses this very light second stage, and methane as a propellant, which is higher performance than RP-1, the second stage should actually have a performance advantage over the Falcon 9 for interplanetary payloads that need to go above escape velocity. They, want, they talked a lot about the materials being used, and they're going to continue to use carbon fibre. Uh, they actually did this very cute demo, which uh, not total accurate representation of uh, capabilities, but here's a sheet of stainless steel, smash an I-beam into it, it dents, here's some aluminium, smash that, here's the carbon fiber, and it just sort of bounces off. And, and look, you know, that is not an accurate representation because in real life, if you had sheet, sheet steel or sheet uh, aluminium that thin, you would probably have it on a tank which is being pressure supported and also chilled to cryogenic temperatures. But regardless, look, it does show that, that uh, Rocket Lab know how to make their carbon fiber composites. They've been doing it for longer and they are sticking with those designs. SpaceX started on carbon fiber for the Starship and then changed their mind because what they really wanted or valued was the ability to rapid, rapidly iterate on the design. And you can't do that when all your structures are having to have complex mandrels and molds and everything built before you can actually wrap them and lay them down and cure them. So SpaceX, they, while they are optimizing their stainless steel for cryogenic performance and to get the best mass to uh, weight as to strength ratio, they are actually taking a hit in terms of pure performance in the, in the name of you know better iterative capability. And also, by the way, the, he also pointed out that relativity using 3D printed aluminium, they're taking the same hit. They want rapid iterability on their designs and they are taking a hit in terms of the strength and performance of the material that they can produce via the 3D printed metal. So continue with carbon fiber, that's the decision they've taken. Uh, I presume, Presumably they've figured out how to make their carbon fiber composites handle the heating of re-entry a whole lot better than uh, the current generation because they're going to be doing a lot of that. I, I mean, actually, to be honest, the things that I would expect to handle the most heating will be the landing legs. The tips of those legs are going to extend past the plane of the engines and those engines are going to be emitting a lot of heat that's going to go right onto those. So those landing tips may well be metal. They might well have some shock absorbers built in. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of iteration to go on this. I have a lot of questions. Like, does the 
since they have to hang the second stage from the first stage, does that mean that they have to integrate the whole structure vertically? They can't do it horizontally like SpaceX and uh, Rocket Lab currently do. Um, is the second stage going to be made of carbon fiber composites or can they actually use metal on that more efficiently? After all, you know, the Centaur that is used on the uh, Atlas V, that's mostly made of very thin stainless steel. So that makes a lot of sense. Is there going to be an entry burn required so that when they hit the atmosphere going down? Yeah, these are questions I'd like to see more about. And I'd like to see more about, uh, you know, neutron going forward. One thing that they didn't mention was an actual launch date. And I totally understand that they don't necessarily want to commit to a hard date because there's a bunch of technical stuff they're going to have to solve. I, I believe they're talking about test firing the Archimedes engine next year. And yeah, that's probably on course for maybe a 2024, maybe 2025. I'm not sure, but it'll be interesting to see how the market looks then and whether Rocket Lab um, has something which will, will allow it to remain competitive with, you know, launch providers of all mass. So yeah, that was a great presentation. I, I liked a lot of the talk about the design and a lot of the innovation that they, they've got going on there. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.